Hello, good day. Um, Assalamualaikum. Welcome to the World of Assessment. Welcome to the World of Principles of Assessment and Evaluation. And it's been a while. And in this uh, video, we are going to look at specifically testing as we are still in testing process. And we're going to have a look at specifically item constructions. And within that, we are going to look at specifically uh, stimuli in item construction. So what exactly in the world are stimuli? Well, stay tuned to find out and also learn about how uh, significant stimuli are in item construction process, as well as how can we use effective stimuli to construct effective items for effective tests. Now, um, the slides which I am using for this video is downloadable from my MOOC page. I'm going to leave uh, the link uh, to my MOOC page below this video. And if you're not my students, um, feel free to drop by. It contains a lot of practical advice, um, videos, notes, uh, what else? Uh, PowerPoint slides, as well as activity sheets for topics that are covered in this semester. Right, so without further ado, let's look at this slide. Now, basically, stimuli uh, is the plural form and the singular form of stimuli is stimulus. We are not talking about ransangan, so stimulus in Bahasa Melayu is ransangan. Uh, we are not delving this from the perspective of psychological or uh, behavioral theory, uh, but we're going to look at it from the perspective of item constructions. So what exactly is stimulus? Uh, stimulus is any material, authentic materials that you take uh, from other sources, for example, newspapers, posters, magazines, websites, videos and uh, integrate this material into your test as part of your item, okay? And stimuli are a must in any items uh, or for any test in any subject matter discipline because we do need to have authentic materials in our test and also we need vehicle in order for us to get to test skills that are intended to be assessed in our test. So if this is confusing, don't worry. We are going to look at uh, this stimuli in more specific, uh, and then it's going to make more sense, OK? I promise. So this is an example of a stimulus. Uh, this is a map, and as the source is from Google Image, which is integrated into a listening test and becomes an integral part of this test. Okay, and within the realm of testing process, um, so this is the process of testing, we are basically here. Uh, so stimulus or the use of stimuli is pertinent within item construction process. Uh, and in fact, uh, stimulus selections as well as item construction process are often carried out simultaneously at the same time because you will be selecting your stimuli based on the learning outcomes as well as based on the items that you are constructing. Hence, they always come together. Okay, uh, so basically, uh, there's a lot of things that teachers can use as stimuli for the test. Uh, and these are five different types of uh, stimuli, but the most common are the first two, which are text, and graphics. Uh, and you can also see other forms or types of stimuli as well. Um, and depending on which uh, area of discipline that you are from, you might use more of one particular type as compared to the other. For example, uh, TASEL students or language students, because I'm a teacher trainer, teacher trainer, Hence, uh, the context of this video is for teacher training, specifically for assessment. So if you are a language student, then you will be using more of text. Not necessarily because we do want to have diverse selections of stimuli in our test, but mostly for reading tests, for example, you have passages. And these are usually uh, the focus of the stimuli in your test. Um, and for art students, um, 
graphics, infographics, of course, numbers for mathematics students and science students. Uh, in fact, science students use more of graphics as well. Um, you can, we are going to look more into this in much later slides in this video. Okay, so um, as I said, uh, <laughs> Suddenly, I'm out of words. All right, so these are basically the stimuli, some samples of stimuli used in language tests. Uh, it runs from simple messages to poem to short stories to excerpts from novel, maps, uh, magazine, newspaper articles, letters, cartoon strips, you name it, you got it. Uh, basically, language is very unique in the sense that they are not testing knowledge, but language often always tests skills. And because of this uniqueness, when it comes to the use of stimuli, language teachers or language teacher trainees can use anything under the sky as their stimuli, as long as it is related to the context of the assessed skills. Okay, um, art students, of course, there's a lot of things that can be used as your stimuli as well from paintings, sculptures, the photos of them when you integrate them as part of your test, uh, posters, buntings, design-wise, uh, cartoons, process, uh, stages, all these are very unique to art testing. Okay, and let's not forgetting our physical health education teachers. Uh, they use a lot of stimuli as well in their tests. Uh, of course, the most common would be the food pyramid, uh, the CPR stages, the uh, menu development to suit to specific lifestyle. And of course, uh, science students, you are not forgotten. Don't worry. Uh, in fact, the wallpaper I have for this particular video, this is basically plant cells. And you are using a lot of uh, cells images as well in your test. And last but not least, mathematics students, of course, with their formulas, their tools, their manipulatives. Okay. Uh, hence, a stimuli is an essential part of item construction process. It will be weird if you have a test without the use of even one stimuli. Just never accounted that. Okay. Let's continue. Uh, the first and foremost, the most important rule to using stimuli is make sure that these stimuli become integral part of your items. Um, they should never be treated as something that can make your test look fun. Like, okay, let's put this picture in because it's going to make it more interesting than just looking at text. No. It has got to serve a purpose. It should be a vehicle for you to assess the intended skills, and it should never be treated as gambar hiasan sahaja in your test. Okay, so this is an example of an effective stimuli. So how do we know whether this stimuli should be here or not? Whether this particular stimulus is just gambar hiasan or does it really serve a purpose in my item? Um, just one very crucial question that you need to ask. Can my students answer this question without this stimulus? If they can, then the stimulus is not effective. But if students cannot answer the questions without the presence of this stimulus in your test, then this stimuli all right, so I keep on uh, interchangeably use the plural and singular form. So if students cannot answer the questions without the presence of this stimulus in your test, then this stimulus is important to be included and they become an essential part of your item. All right, so let's look at this uh, test. These are two items from a listening test which I've taken out and put it here. Um, remember that this is a listening test. So when students sit for a listening test, the teacher will either play uh, the recording of an audio or the teacher will be reading a text for students to listen to and then take down or answer the questions. Okay. 
the things that make these pictures, so in this respect, these are the stimuli that we are talking about. Uh, we have two questions and they are multiple choice. So students will have to listen to a recording to answer these questions. Um, and also by the side of these questions are pictures. Okay, so in this regard, these two stimuli are not effective. In fact, they even uh, bring down the quality of the test because it's crowding the test paper unnecessarily and also because it could hinder um, the process of answering the items effectively. These pictures are not necessary now because you put pictures in there, students have to look at it and uh, while listening to the text uh, or audio and also answer the questions. If you get rid of these two stimuli, it does make your items better and students do not have to look at unnecessary photo to answer the questions when these photos are not related. Okay. Right, so uh, as always, when we develop a high quality instrument or test, there's always considerations that teachers have to make. And this is, there is no exception to stimuli selection. These are the considerations which teachers must exercise and think about when they are selecting the stimuli for their test. Um, it's quite a lot. So we have background knowledge, complexity, length, Students' interests, with teachers often forget, uh, variety, as well as the importance of that stimuli to be free from bias or any sentiments or addressing any sensitive issues. So we're going to look at them one by one. So first, with background knowledge. It's very important for teachers to consider and take into their awareness of the background knowledge that students have prior to answering your test. Uh, usually for most subject, this is not a problem because when you teach your subject, you are the subject matter content, you know what your students have learned and have not learned. So when you put a particular uh, stimulus in your test, you know that students have the schemata or background knowledge to support them to answer the questions correctly or incorrectly. However, uh, this is a different case for language teachers. The, uni the uniqueness, sorry, the uniqueness of language learning is that uh, it does not confine to a particular skill or subject matter discipline. Um, you can learn anything under the name of language. So the same thing goes to teachers when they are developing language tests. They can use almost anything, anything under the sky as stimuli for their test as long as it is related to the context of the item and the intended learning outcomes to be assessed. Okay, so uh, teachers, language teachers, let me just get this moving on because it's not moving. So language teachers can use pie chart, they can use graph, they can use posters, they can use any designs, info, infographics, uh, brochures, templates, anything to assess language skills. Now, it's always fun to have a variety of stimuli in a language test, but when you are taking um, stimuli that is related to other subject matter discipline is very important for teachers to have an understanding and knowledge of what the students know and not know in order for them to answer your questions effectively. So let's see, for example, a language teacher wishes to use a bar graph into her reading test. So first, in order for this language teacher to do that, then the teachers must make sure that students have, in fact, learned bar graph from their mathematics class. Because we are not assessing the graphs, we are just assessing linguistic skills through the use of this graph. So if students are not familiar with bar graphs, have never seen one bar graph before, so how are they going to answer your item? So there is always a risk of turning your good item into an invalid item because of the lack of familiarity 
with the use of your stimuli. Okay, you, you get what I mean? So if you have any questions uh, at any point of this video, at any point of this video, like you can always interrupt me in this video, yeah. So if you do have questions uh, of any aspects of this video, so you can either WhatsApp me personally or you can leave uh, your questions in the comment sections, okay? So in addition to knowing students' background knowledge, uh, let me just get back before I forget. So how can teachers uh, overcome this? What strategies can teachers use uh, in this respect language teachers use to get to know of students' uh, background knowledge? <clears throat> Always have a talk with other teachers teaching other subjects. For example, if you want to include um, a data set in your test, maybe talk to their science teachers and talk to their mathematics teachers to just to get an idea whether have they covered this topic in their tests, in their lessons or not, okay? <coughs> Sorry, guys. It's been two weeks and I'm still coughing. Right, so in addition to looking at students' background knowledge, it's important to consider, very, very important, the complexity level of the stimuli that you use in your test, okay? Uh, particularly when multiple, multiple, sorry, particularly if multiple stimuli are used. And it is not uncommon. In fact, it's very common for a test to have a lot of stimuli. So it's always multiple in nature. All right. And when you are using several stimuli in your test, then you have to think of varying levels of complexity collectively of all these stimuli. All right, so if your test only uses one single text, okay, it's very important for you to find a text which you feel that all the students in your class will be able to understand um, regardless of their ability levels because we are going to use this text for the students to employ the intended linguistic skills. Therefore, understanding of the text is very important. Hence, it is very, very important for teachers to be able to match the use of the stimuli to students' level of abilities. Okay? That being said, what if you use multiple texts? And of course, this is a common context within any Text within any discipline. However, when multiple texts are used, uh, when you are using more than one text or more than one stimulus in your test, in the case of uh, reading tests, for example, it's common for teachers to use uh, sometimes up to four or five passages in a single test. So when you are using more than one passage, for example, you have to think of varying the levels of complexity of these passages. And we don't want to end up with a, a test that has five passages, but all of these passages are exactly at the same level of complexity. Now that's not effective. You do want to have collectively passages that are varying, okay? Uh, with the first few passages are uh, directly uh, targeted towards the understanding of low ability students. And as you move further, the final passage is more complex and it is targeted directly in terms of the levels of complexity to the level of ability of your high ability students. So this is a very important consideration. So you need to find um, a collection of stimuli that has varying degree of complexity, okay? So uh, you can read this on your own later. I'm not going to delve this further. Um, this is not just uh, for language, definitely for mathematics, for example. You also need to think of complexity. Any subject discipline have to think of complexity of your stimuli when you are using a lot of stimuli in your test. All right, so we have looked at background knowledge. We have also looked at, where's my hand? Okay, we have looked at background knowledge. We have also looked at complexity. Now, the third thing which teachers need to consider is the length 
of the stimuli still very important so when multiple stimuli are used then the considerations uh, towards length becomes more important so teachers language teachers with their passages uh, teachers with the use of graphic images uh, process and procedures for science teachers um, then we have physical and health education teachers with their um, health fitness and lifestyle related materials and of course math teachers with their tools formulas and manipulatives so chances are when you construct your test you will be using a lot of a lot you will be using lots and lots of stimuli in your test hence we do want to make sure that the use of these stimuli uh, does in fact enhance um, task effectiveness and do not drag students answering time unnecessarily so i'm going to go back to my first page now teachers have love towards a lot of things and and they have interests and preferences and sometimes they do want to demonstrate or showcase uh, their love uh, for photography for example as part of their item in the form of stimuli but having said that um, testing is constricted in terms of time when students answer your test they only have like one hour or one hour 30 minutes to do that so you can't afford to ask anything uh, you have to be very careful with the items that you have constructed in terms of the content that your items represent you also have to be very very careful with your stimuli uh, so that this stimuli does not interfere with your test effectiveness now in my experience when i go through uh, work which students submitted um, they do tend to put a lot of stimuli which is not harmful but when there's too many it starts to get in the way of um, item effectiveness so we don't want that for language training teachers for example when do when they develop reading tasks uh, I do receive submission, for example, for one hour test up to 10 different passages. That's just too much. Now, remember, this is a very, very important key point. Okay. If you have like 10 passages and then these passages are long and students will be spending a lot of time reading these passages. And this is longer than the actual time that they take to answer your questions. Now that just defeats the purpose. So we do want to have multiple stimuli, but not too many. We also need to consider the fact that when multiple stimuli are used, the length is different from one stimuli to another. So length is, my dear students, a very important consideration. Let me just check whether do I have an example or a sample for this i do okay so this is basically um, a sample of few items uh, we just want to talk about the length okay and also density uh, the number of stimuli that you should have in your test as well this is an example of a reading test now this is a common format for asking reading tests if you were to flip through uh, activity book or samples of reading tests you will be able to see the same pattern where one stimulus is presented followed by one item and then another stimulus is presented followed by another item sometimes students are given quite a long passage for them to read and then followed by one question is there anything wrong with this? Not necessarily, but can we improve this? Yes, we can. Uh, from the perspective of stimuli used, okay, uh, do in fact mobilize on a number of items for one stimulus. Don't end up asking one question only for one stimulus. Um, give them credit. For the time that they have spent reading through your stimulus at least have three items don't just have one in fact from a stimulus point of view it is always better to have one stimulus followed by a number of items 
which students can employ various linguistic skills in order to get understanding of the text, rather than having three texts and then one item for each text. They'll be spending a lot of time reading the text and then they're only being tested with one item. So that's not effective. So it's always good to present one text, for example, followed by several questions. And these questions are basically a combination of both lots and hots. Okay, I'm just going to go back to my earlier points. Right. And also do not have the perceptions or conceptions that the more number of stimuli means that my task is better, not necessarily. Uh, if you can reduce the number of your stimuli to much lesser number, but mobilize on more items instead, that's even better. Okay, so the key is having less stimuli, but more items, not more stimuli and more item. Okay. <coughs> so when you do have, in fact, a number of passages, say, for example, you are using passages, make sure that these passages are different in terms of their length and uh, you always have to strategize in a manner that for example your shortest stimulus will have the most um what do you say uh, appropriate language for your low ability students and when you move to the longest passage for your stimulus this passage in fact contains complexity <coughs> that that is appropriate to your high ability students and when you do have an array of passages of different length when you present these passages into your test pages then the shortest passage should appear in the earlier sections and accordingly the longest passage should be in the final section of your test okay if you achieve this then your task in terms of the use of stimuli is awesome. Okay, students, students, schools, Kalyan, moving on uh, to interest. Now, of all the other considerations which I have mentioned, we've looked at background knowledge. I am going to look at where can I find my thumb. Okay, we've looked at background knowledge, we've looked at um, complexity, we've looked at length. But interest is usually a factor or an aspect that is often over, um, overlooked. I was about to say underlook. It's actually overlooked. Okay, um, basically, a lot of studies have been done looking at the relationship between um, the use of stimuli as well as the engagement towards tasks that students have. And of course, as you may have expected, uh, when teachers include topics or passages for stimuli that are directly related to students interests students um, display higher level of engagement towards the assessment task okay hence it's very important to think about students interests when you are selecting your stimuli this may not be that uh, significant when it comes to other subject matter disciplines for language, uh, especially, uh, considerations uh, towards students' interests is very, very important. Okay, I know that this is like a lot of things to do. You have to think of the different levels of complexity, their background knowledge, and then the different lengths of the passages that you have in your test. Now you have to think about what your students like and don't like. But I can assure you that if you're able to manipulate on this, it can really, really make your test effective and you can really, really increase the level of focus and engagement that your students have towards your test. Okay, so uh, a majority of PISA countries, uh, these are countries that are taking PISA assessment. It is found that, um, of course, uh, girls displayed higher engagement towards reading than boys. And uh, in terms of reading choices, um, well, uh, the male students are found to love newspapers and web pages more than female students. And also a study by three researchers, Ailey, Heidi and Brendolf, they found that uh, when they presented students 
with four different texts to read across gender, either male or female students. And these four texts are texts concerning body image, chameleons, Star Trek and X-rays. And uh, in this study, they found that uh, male students love or have higher interest on Star Trek and X-ray tests uh, in comparison to female students. And also, interestingly, the effect of interest uh, is stronger for boys than for girls. Now, how does this uh, affect your test? Meaning that when you are selecting your stimuli carefully, and if the use of your stimuli is directly related to the interests of your male students, uh, they are more likely to have greater engagement towards the test than female students. In other words, it doesn't really matter what kind of stimuli or topic that you use in your test for female students, they will persevere. But for boys, when you put in topics that is something of their interest, they are likely to engage better in your test. Okay, so um, the study, the same study also found that um, the three most interesting topics for boys were race cars, basketball players and astronauts. So this study was carried out in the United States. Hence, you have to be very careful not to uh, have a blanket acceptance towards the findings of this study because there's always a difference in terms of the uh, culture, religion and worldview perspectives. Okay, We don't have, uh, well, basketball is not really a thing in Malaysia. Football is a much uh, love sports here uh, in comparison to basketball. So uh, it's very interesting to go through uh, studies that look at the use of stimuli and how they increase uh, test engagement, but always take it with a pinch of salt. That's basically it is. Okay, so it is always worthwhile to get to know your students a little better, trying to get to know what are their likes and dislikes, their preferences and their interests and use this information to assist you in the process of selecting your stimuli. Okay, so of course, there are certain yawn-worthy topics. I'm not going to yawn here and pretend yawning, okay? Uh, he's doing a great job at that. So basically, um, cars, mechanics, and carpentries are such a turn-off for girls uh, as much as beauty and skincare are for boys. Uh, statistics and manuals always makes you doze off and basically anything that has no relation with the living and the relevance of your students. Okay, well you get the idea. But then you may say, if I only include stimuli that directly link to students' interests, then they will not be learning anything new. I want to in fact integrate something new as my stimuli so that this will be an educational process for my students. If you have this kind of thought, then you have mad respect from me. You are that kind of teacher who always try to make even testing experience a learning experience, which is a good thing, okay? Um, we do want to include stimuli or passages or texts uh, that is not familiar to the students because by reading the passages, it will be learning for them. So we do want that. But out of all the passages that you have for your test, for example, you don't want all of these passages to tackle or address topics that is truly foreign. Okay? So do include stimuli that would somehow create learning experience. I do encourage that. However, do consider students' psychological state of mind when they have to sit for the test, that's nerve-wracking. Sitting for the test alone is nerve-wracking for students, okay? And you do want to ease the process of testing by including stimuli that your students are familiar with. If you want to integrate something new, by all means, do so, but not for all the stimuli. Maybe if you're using five stimuli, then two of these stimuli are something new, but the remaining three should be something or topic that students are already familiar with. Okay. Right. Um, 
please read these slides on your own uh, in addition to watching this video. <clears throat> the next point is diversity or variety. So <clears throat> you also need to think uh, that your test, if multiple stimuli are used, so these stimuli should represent various same schemes and topics and not just talk about the same thing again and again okay uh, remember your students motivations and psychological state of mind if they have to go through five different passages for example for your reading test and all of these five passages talk about recycling come on guys you don't want to like tire them out you do want to have a good representations of many topics various topics in your stimuli uh, and if you do have for example talk about recycling then have a different passage maybe a fairy tale for example or maybe a poster so variety comes in two ways uh, for reading for example you do want to have passages uh, which address on various aspects of things in life and not just focus on one particular aspect. It is also variety in terms of the types, format and genre of your stimuli. So if you do have, if you want to work on five passages for one text, for example, then don't all don't let all of them be text you do want to include posters you can use pamphlets letters messages so um work on and press on different types of stimuli that you have because if you are able to do this you are able to build on students interest and then increase the engagement that they have towards the test okay so i just want to mention um in passing that we have gone through several different considerations that you must exercise when you are constructing your items in light of stimulus selection okay we've looked at background knowledge complexity um, length uh, variety so all of these is very very important for effective item and effective test so it's not just your item have to be effective your stimuli also have to be effective to make an overall effective test so these are several additional guidelines uh, and this is also a recurring themes uh, in the submissions of your work to me which i find this semester uh, so number one uh, please make sure that if passages are used you credit the author accordingly and sufficiently so if uh, you have passage or text in your test posters or any form of stimuli for that matter please credit the source please mention where did you take this particular stimulus from okay it's very very important so what information to be included i've listed down here please have a look at this particular powerpoint slide and if you are doing listening tests for example so listening test is very unique and different because you do have to pro provide additional file uh, or the audio file or a separate document. Uh, you have to think in advance, how would I go about carrying out this listening test? Uh, will I be playing my audio tape and then students listen and then answer the questions on the test script? or will i be getting a text and i will be reading out loud the text in front of the class when they are taking the test so you do have these two important considerations all right so if you want to use audio uh, tape for your test if you want to play this particular tape uh, or file people don't use tape anymore sorry <laughs> me being a relic so if you want to play an audio file um, and then students listen and answer the test questions so you have to find these audio files either download from youtube or maybe you record your own conversation with your colleague or your friend for example and then play it as part of your listening test so all these are stimuli as well hence it's very important to um, make sure that the audio clips or the video clips that you are using for this test is clear and of fine quality okay 
clear in the sense that you can students can actually listen to the words that that these uh, <coughs> audio tapes are playing or audio files are playing okay and make sure that it still complies with the remaining of the considerations uh, of stimulus uh, stimulus selections complexity of the language the length uh, variety for my art students uh, pjk students math students and <coughs> science students you will be using a lot of stimuli as well so make sure that they comply to these particular guidelines uh, directly related to the context of the item uh, and it does in fact enhance item effectiveness and also they are clear especially arts when you have to present a painting for students to comment on for example so the print quality must be clear uh, that's basically what stimuli selection is a video so the key takeaways is that we have a look at different types of stimuli we have also looked at considerations that students uh, have to make i mean like students being you teacher trainees uh, that you have to make when you are selecting your stimuli there's a lot of considerations there, but these considerations are extremely, extremely important. And also the rules and guidelines for using effective stimuli with the main goal of developing high quality tests. So thank you so much for your time. If you do have questions, make sure that you leave your questions below in the comment section. So thank you so much. Assalamualaikum and see you when I see you. Take care because I care. Okay, bye students.